whatever your thoughts are on California as a state, there is no denying that it is the home to some of the most awe-inspiring landmarks, not just in the US but in the world. Sequoia National Park in particular, which is 631 square miles of beauty, is home to one of the oldest and largest living organisms in the world, the behemoth General Sherman Redwood Tree. It's mind-boggling to think that this ancient being was alive for thousands of years. It was alive during the American Revolution, during the Spanish Inquisition. It was alive during the reign of King Tut, as many of its sister redwoods were that constitute the forest lands. This lost world has seen its share of rivers moving and species evolving, and unfortunately going extinct as well. The last known California grizzly bear sighting was in 1924, after they were thought to have been hunted to extinction by prospectors who poured into the California mountains during the gold rush. Who knows, there could still be one out there somewhere. These type of sightings happen quite frequently. The Yangtze River dolphin, thought to be extinct, has also recently reappeared. Beyond the California grizzly bear and the Cyclopean redwoods, I believe there is something else in those mountains. The radical California wildfires that had been plaguing the state for nearly two decades have had a monumental, possibly irreversible toll on the various parks' ecosystems. While most fires are natural and sometimes necessary, they have been getting more pervasive and out of control. However, there is another cause which is much less talked about. Over the years, people have been pushing more and more into the California wilds, not only creating infrastructure which gives fuel to fires, but carelessly causing them as well. Just some of the causes of the wildfires range from vehicular sparks to faulty power lines and so on. As a result, animal populations have begun to flee their homes and push back into towns and cities, occasionally resulting in attacks. The craziest stories of animal attacks weren't coming from those that wandered into town though. Soon after, there was circulations of attacks from strange, unidentified creatures that were monstrous in nature. They were described as being nearly the size of a horse and bird-like. They sounded so outlandish. These people had to have been attacked by mountain lions or, or bears or something. The natives of the area, however, actually had stories of these creatures dating back hundreds of years, so possibly it's not that far-fetched. Either way, something that was once living deep in the woods was now beginning to emerge, it seems. And then I came across something that cemented my intrigue. Not too long ago, my grandfather had passed away. I'd like to believe that he went peacefully, but the poor old man had a few health issues caused by the Central Valley's poor air quality. While rummaging through his old belongings, I came across what my father told me was the old journal of my great-great-grandfather, which my grandfather had kept in an old cedar chest. Apparently, my great-great-grandfather was quite the renowned tracker and surveyor during his time. I spent the whole afternoon reading the thing, emerging myself into a time which sprang into existence right after the era of the American Old West. One of the journal entries details an expedition up into the Sequoia National Forest. July 26th of 1908 the previous few nights have been filled with such peril as I have never felt in all my previous adventures. We have come up into the Sierra Nevadas, my colleague and I, Mr. Jim Foxhart, for a very peculiar job sanctioned to us by the state of California. The state is beginning a more aggressive expansion into these foothills, which were once occupied by the Monachi. They claim this expansion has caused some commotion from some peculiar wildlife, sounding mostly of monsters in their various descriptions. We rendezvoused with a Dr. Edward McMillan, a biology from the University of Davis, who had accompanied us to catalog and identify this potentially unknown species, though I was dubious that we would come across anything of the sort. On about the third night, setting up camp much deeper into the redwood forest, 
I was only an hour or so into my night watch when I began to hear loud screeches, the likes of which were unidentifiable to me. These screeches would come and go at no predictable pattern, but they seemed to be calling to each other and getting louder. Mr. Foxheart was also awakened by this sound, and we sat there together for a good 15 to 20 minutes, attempting to identify what creature it could belong to. Having no such luck, we woke Dr. McMillan, who also stated that these sounds were not of an animal in which he was familiar with. We were certain, however, that it was multiple animals, a pack of some sort, and that they were very predatory. We grabbed our rifles and lanterns and headed towards the source of the nearest cries, but the cries had stopped. I heard some rustling just to our right, and upon raising my lantern, I was flabbergasted to see a large emu of some sort, but with a large horse head, sharp claws on both hands and feet, and a long, feathery tail. Its eyes glistened in my light, and though I only caught a quick glimpse of it, I could see that it was a beast almost the size of a horse. The animal quickly darted off with great speed. The other two men were just as puzzled as I am. Though Dr. McMillan had said that what we had just seen looked very much like a species in the Dromaeosauridae family, a species of dinosaur. We tracked them down for about a mile, but the further we pushed away from camp, the more that we began to hear loud screeches, to which Foxheart agreed, sounded very much like warning cries. Evidently, we were pushing into their territory and deep into the forest. We lost track of the creatures and the calls subsided. We spent another couple of weeks in the forest, but after that night, made no further contact or found any relevant traces, and so decided that this pack must have moved deeper into the forest to avoid human contact. I had never really been a big believer in cryptids like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. Sure, it was amusing to watch those documentaries on the Discovery Channel, or those videos on YouTube, but I always felt that there were other explanations for what people had encountered. This connection, however, was just too tantalizing. There was no way it could be exactly as everyone had described it. Where could it have been hiding all these years? And besides, it had been a while since I had just gotten away back to nature. Not that I needed uh, such an excuse. After an exhausting few months of work and school, balanced my brain was on autopilot. Once the parks had opened back up, I decided to plan a solo outing for myself. I packed up some gear, my Kodak camera, rations, and my lucky knife, and I headed out west to the Sequoias. I drove up the winding roads, past some devastation left by the fires of the summer, businesses and homes that were burnt down. Some were just being cleared. Some were being rebuilt. It was good to see that society would carry on, though I had no doubt in my mind that there were lives that were ruined. Would we ever learn a lesson? It was good to get out of the car after a few hour drive and stretch once I had found a good campsite. I was lucky to find a place so secluded, probably because this was an area which was associated with the alleged attacks. I actually did go on evening hikes with my Kodak and a field recorder. I'm not sure what I expected, really. I guess I let my imagination get the best of me. I only wanted to spend a good week. I don't like wasting my vacation leave willy-nilly. And then it became real. It was a Thursday night when I was awoken from my sleep by a loud screeching sound. It invaded my dreams first and then pulled me out looking up at the moonlit tent walls. I lay there quietly for I don't know how long, trying to decipher that sound, the journal entry that came to mind. Was this what my great-great-grandfather had heard? I was both excited and terrified. I had to investigate. I grabbed my Kodak, flashlight, and of course my knife, and slowly crawled out of my tent. I found that I was not as good as my great-great-grandfather had been at determining directions, as the sound sounded like it was coming from all around the forest, echoing through the old pines and off the cliffs. It soon became apparent to me that, as my grandfather had also determined, there were multiple calls responding to each other. 
I don't know what oddly placed bravery came over me, but I had the sudden courage to search into the dark forest for them. I quietly scanned the area for them, at first only circling my campsite. Luckily, I had a good sense of direction, so I knew I wouldn't get lost. I then got a good bearing on where the sound was emanating from, so I started strolling in that direction. I walked for a good ten minutes when these screeches suddenly began to bark louder and more frequently. I heard a rustle just off in the distance to my left. I quickly aimed at my powerful light, and I saw a black bear running off. It wasn't really the bears that I was worried about though, as I always had a small can of bear spray on me. But what was he running from? For whatever asinine reason, maybe I was still a bit tired, but I pressed on. Now, I'm not a tracker by any means. I wasn't even in the Boy Scouts. But I could have sworn that I saw odd bird-like tracks in the dirt. Or at least, I thought I did. The hair stood on my neck as, more and more, the events of the journal entry and the story suddenly became more plausible. It couldn't be, could it? This whole time, I guess I just thought I was going to find some loudly mating birds and then have a good chuckle and go back to bed. There was a more commotion going on around me. I would frantically whip my light in the direction, but I would see nothing. Maybe about an hour or so into my night stroll, I came across some odd structure. It looked like some kind of weaving of sticks and trash. I cautiously approached for a closer look. My god, it was a nest, and there were eggs in there, odd looking eggs. They looked like the size of regular chicken eggs actually. I stood there dumbfounded for a moment, and then it hit me. Something literally hit me. I went stumbling back as something slammed into my side with immense force. I quickly scrambled to my feet and frantically looked around. There were clicking noises now coming from all around me. And then I saw it. It jumped out of the foliage with a tremendous height and began to cackle at me, bowing low. It was trying to intimidate me. Some sort of bird-like animal with a long tail and diagonally pointing up, and a long snout and claws at the end of its feathered arms. I instantly drew the connection between these creatures and the creatures of my grandfather's stories. I just stumbled upon something that may have existed for millions of years evolving in its own way, in near total isolation and uncategorized by humans. Funny enough, however, I did note one noticeable difference. These creatures were not actually horse-sized, more like the size of a large dog. Some things are just exaggerated, I guess. In either case, the one staring me down sent shivers coursing through my body. I was suddenly knocked down again, I pushed myself up with all of my might, but there was another one. The one in front of me was just a distraction. Now there were three, all flanking me, and I knew that there had to be more. I also knew that they were just defending their nest, but I wasn't any less terrified. The one to my right charged me. I got him with my bear spray just as he had launched. I got him square in the face as he began to flail. The others looked puzzled and squawked at each other. I quickly sprayed a line of spray and backed away slowly. I continued fast walking backwards with my light on their nest until it was out of sight. I would continuously hear squawking from around me. These forest ninjas were monitoring my every move. I had my bear spray ready as I figured that would be a more effective defense than my knife. It wasn't nearly as sharp as what they were packing. Every once in a while I would catch a glimpse of them their eyes shining in my lights off in the distance, flanking me. If these animals really wanted to, they could have swarmed me easily. I think they were just being sure that I didn't pose a further threat to their nest. They weren't taking any chances and neither should I. I began hiking towards my jeep, bypassing my campsite as it would have been foolish of me to try to sleep there tonight. After some time, as I approached the roadside clearing where I parked my jeep, the squawking and rustling had faded. I hauled myself into my jeep, exhausted from the running and the terror. 
but I locked the door as to recline my seat and lay there contemplating what I had just experienced, wondering if it was real or just a dream brought on by too many nights watching creepy videos. I didn't notice myself and drift off to sleep. The next morning, I got up late around 11ish. As you can imagine, after having the rough night that I did, I made the short hike to my campsite and found it undisturbed. I packed up my tent and the rest of my belongings and gear, but took one last look around the site. I didn't see anything that would provide indication of what had happened last night. I normally don't drink coffee, but I grabbed some at the nearest 7-Eleven, as I figured I would have a long drive home. I unpacked my stuff as usual, as if nothing different had happened this time. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe it was a dream. Heck, I didn't even think to use my camera or my field recorder. And dang it. As I was unpacking my backpack, however, I noticed something that was caught to the back strap. It was a feather. A large feather.